Good morning, First Baptist Church family. Uh, today is the last installment of uh, virtual Sunday school that I will be teaching for you. And uh, we will be again talking about Jacob as Kobe finishes up his sermon series on the life of Jacob. Um, today, his text comes from Genesis 32, verses 22 through the end of the chapter. And let's begin um, by talking about a little of the background of what's happening at this part of the story. We see Jacob had been living with his father-in-law Laban um, for several years now, and it is time for him to return home to the land of his father, uh, which is problematic there because uh, in, earlier in the life of Jacob, we know that he moved away to um, escape the fury and anger of his brother Esau. And so after many years have passed, after um, Jacob has stole Esau's birthright, um, he's going to return home to face his brother face to face for the very first time. And I would imagine um, as, as he was preparing to do this, uh, like many of us, uh, he had fear and for good reason. I think it would only be natural that he would be fearful of this uh, interaction to come with his brother whom he had a distressed relationship with. So what we're going to see here through the story that we look at today is that uh, our human nature makes us default uh, to making decisions based on our sinful past and what present circumstances that we have. Um, we will see that during the story of Jacob, he defaulted to both of these as he prepared to meet Esau after the 20 years uh, that had passed since he had stolen Esau's blessing and um, lied to his father. So let's uh, look at the text for today, starting in verse 22 of Genesis chapter 32. It says that during the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female slaves, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream along with all of his possessions. Uh, Jacob was left alone. And the man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled and dislocated his hip. Then he said to Jacob, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. Jacob, he replied. Your name will no longer be Jacob, he said. It will be Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he answered, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob then named the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, he said, and I have been delivered. The sun shone on him as he passed by Peniel, limping because of his hip. That is why to this day the Israelites don't eat the thigh muscle that is at the hip socket because he struck Jacob's hip socket at the thigh muscle. So um, we see here that Jacob quite literally has a physical altercation with God uh, where the uh, commentary says that uh, we believe that uh, it was either he actually wrestled with wrestled with God. You can tell my southern my southern Appalachian roots wrestled, huh? uh, but he wrestled with God. Or um, a lot of scholars also believe that it was an angel um, that had been given authority by God to um, carry out this uh, wrestling with Jacob and to give him the authority to change his name. Um, but to set up this story, we need to, to look back just a few verses because uh, whenever we're told that Jacob had retreated uh, or crossed the ford of Jabbok, 
it was because he um, was approaching the land of his brother and he became very frightened. And so uh, earlier in the earlier in this chapter, we see that um, Jacob divides uh, the people into two groups and uh, because he thinks that his brother's going to come destroy him. So he divides his flocks and his uh, the slaves into two groups and he and his family fall back and he decides what he's going to do is send a big, beautiful gift to his brother Esau to hopefully uh, appease him to gain favor with his brother. And so earlier, uh, what, so we see that Jacob sends messengers to inform Esau of his return, uh, but then he panics whenever um, he finds out from his messengers that Esau is on his way out to meet him, and he's coming with an entourage of 400 men. Um, so this, this news greatly distressed Jacob, and he was afraid. So we see that the result is he divides the people that were with him, and he also divides the flocks and herds and camels into two companies. And his rationale for this, he says, is uh, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. So Jacob assumes that Esau is coming to attack him. And so, uh, well, we can all say that Esau would be justified in coming to attack Jacob because of uh, the deception that Jacob had transpired against his own brother. Um, so, instead of appropriating the promises that God had given to them, or that had been given to Jacob, uh, the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and your family, and I will be with you. Um, God had promised Jacob that he would be with him, and to gave him instruction to return to the land. But yet, we see that Jacob uh, has this little brief uh, hiccup in his mentality and he forgets the promise that God made to him and his human nature come, uh, takes over and he becomes fearful. So um, what does, so Jacob, Jacob acts out of his human instinct and tries to think ahead of how he can appease Esau and uh, instead of relying on that promise made to him by God. Um, so in the last 20 years, uh, the Jacob has been taught that God is faithful. So um, he turns to God in faith and he says, O oh God, my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you. So we'll see that Jacob uh, eventually humbles himself before the Lord in prayer and he seeks God's intervention. He also prays, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother of my children. And for you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. And so uh, we see Jacob have this moment of clarity where he affirms God's promises through prayer. And we see this um, throughout the patriarchs uh, here of where um, they, they kind of do this panic thing and they forget God's promises and then they reaffirm God's promises and then ultimately God will reaffirm his promises to uh, his people and so but um, human nature is a hard thing to overcome it's hard for any of us to give up control um, to to our circumstances because 
we want to be in charge of the outcome. And so uh, Jacob gets up the next morning uh, and he reverts back to his, after his old strategies of um, operation when he orchestrates an impressive string of gifts for Esau. And Jacob relies upon these gifts that he has for his brother to appease him rather than on God to protect him. However, God has gone on before J Jacob, and we see that Esau will warmly embrace him. And so that's much like our lives every day. Um, at least for me, it's a personal struggle. We know God's promises, um, but when something's going wrong, it's hard for me personally to affirm God's promises and to give that totally over, over to him, um, knowing that he is faithful to um, fulfill his promises. So that's what we ultimately learn from uh, these early chapters in the book of Genesis in the beginning is that God, God is faithful. And so uh, what we'll ultimately see though, that is that Jacob will need to demonstrate his repentance toward his brother by gift giving. It's not the gifts that ultimately save Jacob's neck. It's that God does. So throughout this story, there's several helpful truths about God and faith development that we can learn. Um, one of those is that a promise from God obligates God to do for man what man cannot do for himself. And that, uh, that's a big pill to swallow, right? Um, We've learned from a very early age that if we uh, work hard and put our mind to it, that we can accomplish anything, right? And so uh, whenever we work hard and we can't accomplish something, um, it's, one of, it's one of those times that we really need to rely on God's promises that he's faithful to. Um, like Twerpy said last night in the children's sermon is that he is faithful and just to work um, all things to good for those who are called according to his purpose. So we also learn that a promise from God provides a filter through which man can see the activity of God by faith in the midst of adversarial circumstances. And for this, uh, it's a very practical and relevant truth, um, especially during this pandemic. Um, it's a time where I'm sure many people question the presence of God and how could a loving God allow so many people to die and suffer from this, uh, this virus. But we have to have faith and believe that in some way in the midst of this uh, difficult season of life that God is going to make something beautiful out of it. What we we'll also learn from the story is that tests generally follow the reception of God's promises. Um, they provide man with an opportunity to default to unbelief and act sinfully or to exercise faith and trust him to do what he has promised. And so that's another problem that we have is that uh, it's hard for us to wait on God's timing. We see that between Abraham and Jacob here are not Jacob, but we'll see between Abraham and, and Moses um, and Joseph. Joseph. May have to get some clarification from Kobe on this one because I'm having a lapse of memory here. But overall, we'll see a 400-year gap before the people enter the promised land. And so... Um, it's hard for us to uh, keep our focus on something that we're not seeing fulfilled. And so uh, we will see this kind of theme uh, in the life of Moses. Uh, whenever he goes to the mountaintop to receive the law from God and he comes back and they uh, manage to build an idol um, while he's, uh, that may have been after the Ten Commandments. Help, Kobe, help. Uh, 
just just watch for Kobe's comments in the comment section to to correct my errors. Uh, but that's kind of uh, the theme that we'll see is that when God makes a promise, we'll see a test, right? And so we've seen that this promise was made to Jacob to return to the land that God would be with him. And so we see this, this test of where um, Jacob tries to intervene on, on his own behalf, but ultimately the gifts have nothing to do with his uh, brother Esau welcome, welcoming him but rather it's uh, through the divine intervention of God um, to fulfill his promise. And so we will see that through the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, that ultimately through this lineage that we will have the Christ child who will um, fulfill the ultimate promise uh, that we will have a redeemer that will finally reconcile us to God so that we may have that communion and relationship with him. So as we study uh, today's lesson and Kobe preaches uh, the sermon today, um, it's my prayer that we will uh, wrestle figuratively much as Jacob literally wrestled with God or an angel about our unbelief of God and his um, faithfulness to always come through on his promises for us. Um, let us pray as we conclude uh, today's lesson. Next week, uh, you're all in for a real special treat. You'll have Dr. Bill Ireland teaching you. I'm so glad that I didn't have to follow him uh, as I'm quite a rookie and an amateur at this. Um, you all will have a, a great study with him and then we'll truly be blessed by him, I'm sure, as we were blessed to have him as our interim pastor. He was truly a gifted teacher and I hope that you all will tune in next week to uh, be blessed by Dr. Ireland's lesson. Let us pray. Dear God, we just thank you for this season in our lives of where um, we've been provided this opportunity to slow down and step back and truly evaluate what is important, God. We are thankful for your promises that um, you, you make for us each day, God, and that you are faithful to always uh, follow through and complete those promises to us, God. I just pray, Lord, for uh, those in our community that are suffering uh, through this pandemic, God, whether it be because of loss of a job um, or they're struggling with child care or uh, any number of things that uh, the virus has impacted, just not um, people physically, God, but also emotionally and making their, our lives so different, God. But I just pray, Lord, that you would be with them and provide for their needs um, as we continue through this difficult season, God. Just go with us and guide us as we continue to seek you in our lives, as we continue to try to be a light on the hill for you, God. I pray, Lord, all of these things in your son's precious name. Amen.